Welcome to Upstream University. In this video series, we will team up with some of the mental health community's most respected experts to explore effective and often new and innovative ways to address issues before they become serious mental health challenges. Together, we will travel upstream to understand ways in which we can reduce risks and increase resiliency, and to identify early signs of mental health needs when services and support can more effectively enable recovery. This episode will focus on the social determinants that often diminish the mental health of people and disproportionately impact people of color. We will also explore the opportunities available to address these issues of inequality. Hello, everyone. My name is Andres Felipe Schola. I'm a professor of psychiatry at UC Davis. And today I would like to talk with you about mental health and mental health disparities through the lens of public health and the science of stress. This presentation, I'm going to go over a couple of very important concepts. I want to give you an idea how to understand mental health prevention and early intervention to prevent those disparities to occur in the first place. The United States has pretty dismal statistics. We have an enormous uh, uh, high rates of mental disorders, several kinds, some of the most important, including mood disorders, substance abuse, and anxiety disorders. One in five adults in the US has a diagnosis of mental illness, but only a small percentage, less than 50%, actually receive care in any given year. Mental health is usually thought of separate from health, physical health. But what I want to uh, help you consider that the latest research is indicating that absolutely both are intricately connected in many ways. Now, in order to understand the outcome of health, how is that produced, we can think of five crucial elements in this. We have genes, we have environments, but we also have timing. So the interaction depends on when in time it happens. The other two elements are the amount of stress and very important, the resources that we have to buffer that stress. And here we can see that within timing, we have two more elements that are very important to understand. These are the brain critical periods and sensitive periods. Let's talk now about health equity and inequities. In an optimal scenario, we have resources and stress equitably distributed among different populations. In current circumstances, our society, for a number of reasons, is organized in a way that certain groups have more stress and less resources, where other groups have more resources to buffer stress and less stress. So the result of that is that we have inequitable health outcomes. Inequitable health outcomes means that when you compare a certain problem, health problem, between various populations, you see uh, differences that are unjust and avoidable. So when we talk about promotion of mental health, and early intervention and so forth, we need to think about the stress and resources piece and understand that in order to uh, address these inequities, we have to give more resources to those populations that have less. When we talk about stress, we need to make a difference between healthy stress or helpful stress and toxic stress. This is especially important during childhood, during those sensitive and critical periods that we were talking before. Currently, in primary care, there's an enormous effort to try to detect certain conditions before they develop. So, for example, there's screening for certain types of cancer, and there's also regular checkups to see how your blood sugar or your cholesterol is measuring. Unfortunately, we don't do such a good job in, when it comes to mental disorders and 
intervene at that level before they become a problem. The concept of going upstream is very important because in public health, we are very good at going downstream and not so good to going upstream to the cause of causes of these disparities and inequities. I want to mention two examples, only two of many, about prevention of mental health problems and health problems in early intervention. Early intervention example is this program housed at UC Davis called SAC EDAPT. It's an early psychosis program. And it has shown uh, this program and others like it around the world that they're very effective in preventing complications and they're associated with gains in multiple outcomes of people with psychotic illness, less hospitalizations, more adherence to medications, uh, more employment, finishing school, etc. The other example of a prevention is the Nurse Family Partnership, a program that has been uh, studied very well and is, shows that this program, uh, nurses that visit mothers can uh, years later be associated with uh, significant improvements in behavioral health, mental health of children and the mother, as well as other outcomes, social outcomes, such as the ability of the mother to complete schooling and have employment. And so this, um, this program works uh, specifically with the ability of mothers to buffer stress, to develop an attachment to the child and prevent toxic stress in that child. The last topic that I wanted to mention is resilience. When I was talking about decreasing stress and increasing resources, we're not talking about only to increase the individual resources someone may have, for example, access to healthcare, but also resources that are true for that community, very importantly, and for society. These various elements that I discussed today are being currently studied, researched, and also taught to healthcare providers to create trauma-informed care and approaches, not only in healthcare, but also in other social services agencies. The idea is that this science that I presented can be used to inform policies and practices and also training the next generation of mental health practitioners and also medical students and physicians to understand this science and be able to apply it to the patient care of individuals and populations. Thank you very much.